Andrew and I met while he was employed by my father, and that is how we got married. Andrew and I made the decision for me to stay at home after the wedding so I could pursue my interests in knitting and sewing. Every winter, I loved crafting scarves and gloves for him. I worked hard to perfect my craft until he would proudly compare them to ones from the shop. This support stoked my enthusiasm, and I dreamed of our future child joining me in this pastime, a dream that made us both happy. I've been married to Andrew for six years. Despite not having children, we have contentment in our relationship. It means the world to me that Andrew attempts to make time for us on his days off, even with his hectic career. That being said, there are times when his art makes me feel a little alone. Our peaceful existence was appended three years ago when I unexpectedly passed out at home from vertigo. I was hurried to the hospital by Andrew. When I woke up, I heard him talking to the doctor about my situation. I would have to deal with it for the rest of my life because it was so serious. Long hospital stays were expected, even if the incident wasn't immediately life-threatening due to the likelihood of future occurrences. I was nervous, but Andrew was there to comfort me. I was thinking about all the scarves and gloves I had knitted and had thrown away during one of these hospital stays when Andrew said, maybe without thinking, I married you because you're the boss's daughter. His remarks cut me profoundly and made me realize something. It was obvious that we needed to talk about this in order for me to know how you really felt and to find a way to truly enjoy our time together, as we had originally intended when we first got married. Despite his reassurances, Andrew's comforting words during my hospital stay only partially eased my concerns. He held my hand telling me not to worry and promising to visit whenever he could take time off from work. With him by my side, I felt a flicker of hope that everything might turn out okay, even though there were no guarantees. True to his word, Andrew initially visited almost every day. He would check on me, hold my hand, and even bring my favorite sewing tools to help me pass the time. Teaching him to sew became a delightful way to while away the hours, making the monotony of hospital life bearable. We chatted about daily trivialities and stitched together, enjoying each other's company. However, after about a year, these visits became less frequent. Andrew's presence dwindled from daily to only every few weeks. I assumed he was swamped with work and continued my sewing, focusing on a scarf I planned to give him during his next visit. Anticipating my discharge by the year's end, I also started knitting gloves to accompany the scarf, pouring all my affection and longing into each stitch. The day he finally showed up again, I eagerly presented him with the gloves, only to be met with a cold stare. Are you still making these? It's annoying, he said bluntly, pushing the scarf I had made, still pristine and untouched, back into my hands along with divorce papers. His words cut deeper than any physical pain could. Andrew explained that he couldn't continue taking care of me, suggesting it was time for us to part ways. The divorce papers were already signed by him, signaling the end of our journey together. Even though I had sensed a change in our relationship, ever since his visits became sporadic, facing the reality was heart-wrenching. I had always tried to convince myself that he was merely caught up with work, but the Andrew I knew, the kind, attentive one, wouldn't have let work stop him from supporting me. When he stopped coming without any explanation, I knew something was amiss. When I calmly asked him why he wanted a divorce, it wasn't because I was desperately clinging to our relationship. I realized I might have become a burden to him, and if the compassionate Andrew I married truly wanted this, I was ready to let go. This acceptance was painful but necessary, as it was clear the life we once dreamed of sharing was no longer possible. As Andrew's visits became sparse, I found myself grappling with the realization that the partnership he once promised seemed a distant memory. When I finally mustered the courage to ask him why he had changed so drastically, 
his response was shockingly blunt. Isn't it obvious? Ever since I married you, it's been one problem after another. I'm so tired of those scarves and gloves you make every year. Honestly, I only married you because your dad was my boss. He confessed with a harsh laugh that felt like a slap. His words revealed a deep-seated resentment towards the simple joys I cherished in our life together, joys that he now mocked as trivial and embarrassing. As Andrew vented his frustrations, I couldn't help but notice the luxurious, finely made scarf wrapped around his neck, a scarf I had not crafted. It dawned on me that perhaps he had never appreciated any of the gifts I had lovingly made. Maybe they had always been nothing more than an annoyance to him, a realization that stung deeply. After I fell ill and my father retired, it became painfully clear that Andrew no longer felt the need to maintain the facade of a caring husband. During the first year of my illness, he had diligently visited, possibly to preserve his image at work, where he was often lauded for his dedication to his sick wife. This facade of a supportive spouse seemed to benefit him professionally, enhancing his reputation among colleagues. When I confronted him about this, pointing out how his visits seemed more about maintaining his image than genuine concern, Andrew was momentarily taken aback. He then sheepishly admitted that my condition had indeed made things easier for him at work. This candid acknowledgement confirmed my suspicions. To Andrew, my worth had been tied not to our shared life or the love I thought we had, but rather to how my situation could serve his interests. This harsh reality was a turning point, helping me see the vast gap between the life we had promised each other and the one we were living. Throughout my illness, Andrew had seemingly capitalized on the sympathy and goodwill of others. He confessed quite candidly how mentioning my condition at work garnered him extra praise for his supposed dedication and readily granted him breaks whenever he needed them. If I worked late, everyone praised me for being so dedicated. And if I needed a break, all I had to say was my wife is sick, he explained without a trace of remorse. His tone was almost boastful as he added that my illness had inadvertently paved the way for his upcoming promotion dismissing his colleagues as fools who were easily manipulated by his story. As he spoke, I saw not the man I had loved, but a stranger with a cruel smile revealing his true nature. Resigned and realizing the extent of his deceit, I quietly accepted the reality of our situation. Well, if my illness was useful to you, then that's something we probably won't see each other again. So take care, I said calmly handing him the divorce papers. He barely glanced at them before taking them and leaving quickly, marking the end of our marriage. After we left, the weight of it all came crashing down, and I cried alone. Soon after, I was discharged from the hospital and returned to my parents' home. My father was furious when he learned how Andrew had exploited my condition for his gain. I never expected him to act like this, he exclaimed, shocked by Andrew's actions. By then, however, I had come to terms with the end of our marriage and reassured my father, telling him that I wished to stay with them for a while. My parents were supportive, encouraging me to do whatever made me happy, which at that moment meant being with family. Before moving back with my parents permanently, I decided to visit our old house only to discover that the front door lock was broken. Confused, we rang the doorbell and were greeted by a stranger. He informed us that he had bought the house a few months earlier and was now living there with his family. Although my parents were outraged, I chose not to cause any trouble for the new residents and left quietly. Unable to let go of the matter, I called Andrew to confront him about the house. He nonchalantly confirmed, yeah, I sold it while you were in the hospital, keeping the money as my compensation. It was my house originally. His response was yet another blow, but by then I had already braced myself for his selfish actions and focused on rebuilding my life without him. 
Andrew's indifferent tone, as he mentioned the sale of our house, left me deeply sighing. I had only just found out that he had sold our home about a year ago. Around the same time, his visits and concern for me began to wane. It was shocking to learn he had made such a significant decision without even a discussion, especially since we were still technically married and had yet to finalize the division of our assets. Though the divorce papers were signed, we had planned to meet the following week to settle these matters, but Andrew had preemptively acted on his own, which was astounding. When I confronted him over the phone, trying to maintain my composure, I told him, you didn't understand anything. His response was a confused, what do you mean? I simply replied, I'll explain next week, and hung up, turning to my concerned parents. I managed to smile and asked my father for a favor. I outlined my plans and requested his help to prepare everything. I've already prepared all the necessary documents. There's not much time before our meeting next week, but we'll manage. My father assured me with a slightly worried smile. As my father, he likely felt a mix of guilt for having introduced me to Andrew and anger towards him. His determination to support me was palpable, and I was grateful for it. As the day of the meeting approached, I found myself unexpectedly smiling at the thought of Andrew's reaction to the preparations we were making. We decided to hold the meeting at my parents' house. My parents and I sat on one side, facing Andrew across from us. Despite knowing how much pain the divorce had caused my parents, Andrew appeared utterly indifferent, even displaying a slight smirk at times. His demeanor was not just unapologetic, but outright disrespectful and arrogant, which only solidified my resolve. At that moment, seated beside my parents, I felt the weight of the injustice he had done to me, but also a sense of empowerment from the support of my family as we prepared to face him together. As the discussion unfolded, I maintained a calm demeanor, assuring Andrew I didn't plan to ask for too much. He attempted to appear generous, stating that the money from selling the house would suffice. This claim visibly angered my father, but I gently touched his hand to soothe him, signaling that we had the upper hand in this discussion, and there was no need to escalate our emotions. Before we proceed, there's something important we need to address, I said. My father handed me a document, and I held it out for my husband to see. The house was indeed in your name, but the land it stands on belongs to my father, who holds the title, I explained calmly. My husband's face showed a slight frown. So what? The house was still mine. No one can complain. Do you think this gives you a way to get back at me? He chuckled dismissively. It's true, you legally sold the house, I acknowledged. However, since the land is still owned by my father, this poses a significant issue for the family who purchased the house. You sold the house, yes, but as a landowner, my father could theoretically demand rent from the family currently living there. Wouldn't that cause them considerable trouble? I paused, letting the gravity of the situation sink in. We're not planning to take that step. However, we can't simply relinquish our rights to the land without compensation. We plan to offer the family the opportunity to purchase the land. We won't force them out or charge rent monthly, but it would be problematic if they refused to buy, I explained further. Originally, my father intended this land as a gift for us to build our life on, not to be sold off to strangers without consideration. If the family who bought the house refuses to purchase the land, they might even sue you missled into thinking they had full ownership of their new home. Imagine their frustration, thinking they had bought their dream home only to find out about additional unexpected expenses. With the ownership of the land confirmed, we promptly visited the family who had bought the house to discuss these issues and find a fair resolution. This approach not only protected my family's interests, but also showed consideration for the unwitting buyers aiming to prevent 
further conflict and distress. When we laid out the situation to the new homeowners, they were quite understanding but firm. They recognized that any legal complications arising from the sale would fall on the seller, my husband, Andrew. They even mentioned the possibility of suing him if we couldn't reach a satisfactory agreement. Observing Andrew's pale face, I could tell he grasped the gravity of what was at stake. He could face severe financial repercussions. In a shaky voice, he asked, what should I do? I responded with a slight smile. The family could buy the land from us, which would settle everything smoothly. However, you'll need to cover the cost. Once they own both the house and the land, all current issues will be resolved. I continued explaining the complications further. Given that they were unaware of the land's full value when they purchased the house, they might demand compensation from you. That decision is theirs to make. Also, the land is in a prime location, potentially worth more than the house itself. Even if you sold all your assets, it might not cover the costs. Alternatively, you could choose to buy back the house and cover the cost of the land along with a relocation fee for the family. This would return both the house and land to your possession, and you could attempt to resell them. Though after paying the relocation fee, any profit would likely be minimal. I paused to let the information sink in before addressing another point. Regarding alimony, your actions have caused me considerable emotional distress. I intend to seek compensation for that, so keep that in mind. You've used me as a pawn for your career ambitions, and now that I see this clearly, I'm disgusted by everything you've done. I plan to pursue damages for the emotional distress it's caused me. While evidence may be limited and a victory uncertain, discussing this matter is crucial given your current predicament. My father, though retired, chimed in with a stern tone. I still have many connections from my career. I've been in touch with former colleagues who have shared your opinions and actions regarding my daughter. You're being looked down upon by everyone, Andrew, he shared with a cheerfully grim smile. This finally seemed to make Andrew realize the seriousness of his situation. The combined pressure of potential legal and financial consequences, coupled with the loss of his professional reputation, cornered Andrew, forcing him to face these harsh realities head on. The status he had built at work using me as a stepping stone was now crumbling around him. Sitting confidently across from Andrew, I clasped my hands together, my smile radiant, and unlike any he had seen from me before, especially since our separation. Let's discuss what happens next. I began, my voice steady and assured. Andrew, caught up in the gravity of the situation, managed only a strained laugh his eyes brimming with tears. As the negotiations unfolded, it was clear that the advantage was mine. Andrew agreed to pay a limony and also to compensate for the land where our house once stood. We later explained this arrangement to the family who had bought the house, ensuring they were treated fairly and understood the new terms. Everyone came out ahead in the end, with the exception of Andrew, who ended up losing everything. The whispers that my father had quietly started to circulate about his organization increased his losses, damaged his reputation, and eliminated any prospects of advancement. The more these rumors spread, the more alone Andrew got, and eventually he resigned from the company, a decision my father subsequently told me about. One could be tempted to see all of this as karma. The profits Andrew believed he had made by exploitation turned out to be fleeting and crumbled under the force of his deeds. I found comfort and a new purpose in teaching sewing classes now that I'm back at my parents' house. Even though only a few local ladies and kids show up for my classes, I feel incredibly happy because sharing my skills with others makes me feel happy. This unexpected turn of events in my life has taught me that I can still contribute my passion and experience in ways that benefit those around me and myself, even if I choose not to become a mother, a dream I once held with Andrew. 
More than anything else, this has shown me the resiliency of the human spirit and the surprising roots to happiness.